Welcome to Menlo Church, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're tuning in to Menlo Church Online. We at Menlo believe that everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible. Enjoy the, today's message. Well, I want to greet everybody at all of our campuses around the Bay Area, everybody joining us online, everybody in this room. I will remind you, this is your chance to affirm transparency, God bless you, and uh, honesty with great energy and joy. Uh, so hi, everybody. My name is John. I'm a sinner. Hi. Welcome to the program. We are learning together how to live as followers of Jesus. And we give up. We surrender our wills and our lives to God. And then we think up. We ask God to renew our minds, especially as we fill them with his scriptures. And then we look up. We pray regularly to God, primarily asking for knowledge to do his will and the power to carry it out. And then we, we turn in. We love in with each other. We leave isolated living, enter into fellowship together. Uh, it's not what we hear in the sermons. It's what we do in between the sermons that really matters through this series. We're using the language of up, in, and out because that's how we arrange our discipleship here. We want to reach up to a transforming relationship with Jesus and reach into authentic community with each other and then reach out to the world around us. And I want to talk today about a wonderful word that I used to not like but have come to love, and that is uh, to lean into accountability. Let's say you're on the freeway and it's chaos. People are driving badly, they're speeding, they're weaving, they're cutting each other off, they're texting, they're talking on cell phones, they're getting distracted, they're getting angry, they're making non-faith-based gestures at each other, and then a black and white car with a big red light pulls onto the freeway. What happens? It's like a miracle. People slow down. People hit their brakes. Although Nancy always says to me, don't hit your brakes, they'll know you were speeding, just take your foot off the accelerator. Cell phones get put away, fingers get retracted. What changes everything in a single word is accountability. Now, the reality is we're always accountable for how we drive, but we forget, or we think nobody will hold us accountable, nobody will notice, or we make up excuses. I have a nephew named Ryan who has been an officer with the California Highway Patrol for many years. By the way, can we thank God for all the law enforcement officers who put themselves at risk to create a great, safer world for the rest of us? And Ryan was telling me the excuses people have given him when he's pulled them over. This is just one officer. One time a man was on his cell phone, clearly, but when Ryan pulled him over, he claimed that he wasn't on his cell phone. It just looked like it because he had his hand up to pull ear hair out of his ear because he was going on a date. Uh, Ryan pulled one woman over for weaving erratically. She ended up getting a DUI, but she claimed she was sober. She wasn't. She claimed she was, and that the reason she was weaving was that she was talking on her cell phone and breast pumping both sides simultaneously. That was her excuse for why she should be, should be let off for bad driving. He stopped one woman who was going over 90 miles an hour. He said she claimed she needed to gain speed to go up a hill. <laughs> Must have been a very steep hill. True story, while I was going to film the video curriculum for this series, I got stopped by a squad car for holding my cell phone while driving. And I said to the officer, I was not texting, I was not talking, I was following directions to this film shoot. So I thought if I hold the phone up, I won't have to look down and that would actually be safer. I don't have one of those fancy screens, I just drive an old car, I'm just a pastor of a church. And, <laughs> and he let me off with a warning. Can we thank God for law enforcement officers who understand the power of grace and mercy and forgiveness? 
Our capacity to generate excuses is staggering, not just when it comes to driving. I'm stressed because of my boss. I drink because of my problems. I yell because of the kids. I'm late because of the traffic. I'm in debt because. I'm lonely because. I'm bored because. I'm angry because. Meanwhile, the life that I could lead, the character that I could acquire, the contributions I could make, the books I could read, the people I could serve are slipping away moment by moment. And I delude myself. I allow it to happen by just making one excuse after another, not thinking about it. But the reality is I am accountable for my choices, for my life. In Genesis, we're told in the beginning, God creates human beings, says that they're not to eat from one tree. And the man and the woman violate this. They eat from the tree. And there's kind of a pause in the story, and we wonder what will happen next. Maybe God won't notice. Maybe he's too busy running the universe. But he does notice. And he asks them a few questions. Why are you hiding? Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the forbidden tree? He's inviting the man to be accountable. And the man says, it was the woman that you gave me. Whose idea was that woman? It wasn't my idea. And God says to the woman, what have you done? And the woman says, it was the serpent. And God pronounces the consequences of their actions. Judgment. Still loves the man and woman. He'll actually make clothes to cover their nakedness and shame. But he holds them accountable. Who else will God hold accountable? The shooting this week of a Tatiana Jefferson in Fort Worth raises again this anguished question of justice that is so often echoed in the Bible, especially in the prophets. Uh, will those who have power, will those who have privilege ever be held accountable for the wrong so often done to those who lack it? And the very consistent answer from the writers of Scripture is as clear as it is uncomfortable for many of us who have privilege and power. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. What if I'm really good at hiding? And before him, no creature is hidden. But all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Will this really happen? This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Will it be really thorough? But I tell you, everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. In other words, all that we've done, all that we've said, all that we've thought. Famous American statesman Daniel Webster was asked one time, what's the most profound thought that has ever entered your mind? And he replied simply, my accountability to God. No. I'm not accountable for a lot of stuff. I'm not accountable for the suffering others inflict on me. I'm not accountable for the family I got born into. I'm not accountable for my genes. I'm not accountable that on the first day of high school, I was six feet one and weighed 120 pounds and had no pigment in my skin and had braces and glasses and pimples. And my mother dressed me in purple corduroy pants and a pink shirt with balloon sleeves. I'm not accountable for that. I was just lucky. <laughs> but I am accountable for the choices I make today. The life I lead, how I spend my time, how I spend my money, what I feed my mind, how I treat other people, who I notice, who I don't, the words I say, the words I don't, the honesty, joy, love I do or don't live with. I am, we are, accountable to God Almighty. Now, we live in a largely therapeutic culture that tends to focus much more on outside forces that affect our behavior. And one of the impacts of this is you don't often hear people talk about this dimension of God. You often hear people say, I believe in a God of love. You don't often hear people say, I believe in a God of accountability. But you read about it a lot in Scripture. And in fact, it is precisely because God loves us and values our personhood, our little kingdoms, that he gives us the dignity of being accountable. Now, we often use this word accountability in a negative way. We think of holding somebody accountable as getting them into trouble. But from the perspective of Jesus and his community, of following him, of discipleship, of the way, 
accountability to God and other people is actually a great gift. God is not harsh. In fact, through Jesus, through his teaching, his life, his death on a cross, and his resurrection, God offers us forgiveness and grace and mercy and a fresh start that we could never earn on our own. And people who receive that value accountability. They become transparent. They get honest about their behavior. They seek to take responsibility rather than looking for excuses. They care about doing what's right more than doing what's comfortable. They recognize mutual accountability as a fundamental requirement for human flourishing and spiritual growth. And it turns out that deliberately entering into accountability relationships with other people in community of raw honesty has tremendous power for transformation. This is all over the New Testament. No kidding. This entire message could easily have been just one statement after another after another from New Testament writers who were giving their readers the challenging gift of being accountable for living in the Jesus way. And that's why it is the fifth way, the fifth step in this Jesus way. I begin by surrendering my life and will over to God. God, your will be done. Your will be done. Do this all the time. And then I seek to be changed from the inside. I think up, God, fill my mind with great thoughts, especially from your word about who Jesus is. And then I look up, God, help me to remember you're here. Give me the knowledge of your will in this moment. Your will be done and the power to carry it out. And then I love in, I I enter into fellowship. I engage in spiritual practices of care, worship with other disciples. And now this week we enter into mutual accountability. Step five, lean into accountability. I invite another person to help me be accountable to my commitments, to my values, to what I want to live up to. Declaring my key commitments to another person in a concrete way And courageously inviting their honest feedback into my life is indispensable for my spiritual growth and the well-being of our community. So, in the time that's left in this message, I want to make a few key observations about how these steps work, because this is Discipleship 101 in this series. It's real concrete. What matters is not what I say, but what you do. First observation is, Accountability is necessary because it helps me do with somebody else what I would not do all by myself. I have a friend named Rick. I've known him for many decades. I know him. I love him. I enjoy him. I trust him. He lives in Southern California. We get together pretty often. We talk uh, at longer length pretty often. But every morning, as long as we're both available, at 6.50, we call each other up. And we talk about yesterday. Where were you tempted? Where'd you get it wrong? Where'd you get it right? Where'd you see God? What'd you learn? And then we talk about today. What are you facing? What are your challenges? What do you need? And then we pray. And I have literally no secrets from Rick. Now, I entered into that kind of no secret, fully disclosing friendship with him a long time ago. He knows all the details about my financial life. He has access to all of our accounts. He knows what we make and what we save and what we give and what we spend. He knows it all. He knows all about my work life, my dreams, my fears, my struggles, my ego, my failures. He actually listens to my sermons regularly to be able to monitor and give feedback to that part of my life. He knows all about my sexual life, my commitments, my thought life, my relationship with Nancy. It's been very helpful to me. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, and I was committed to God, but managing sexuality, what what, what do I fill my life with? How do I live up to my values? That was a challenge. And Then I went to seminary, and I thought, well, maybe when you're a pastor, you just don't wrestle with sexuality anymore, and that turned out not to be true. And Then I got married, and I thought, well, probably when you get married, you just have sex nonstop all the time, so you never have to worry about sex and temptation and stuff again. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way, so I invited Rick into this part of my life. And when I travel, I let him know. I want to be traveling, check in with me when I get back, make sure I honor my commitments, and he always does. There is no significant guilt, humiliation, failure, embarrassment, sin, or shame in my life that Rick does not know. And I wanted to make sure that you didn't think I was making him up. So I asked him if he would just verify this. Would you take a look at the screen just for a moment? Hello, I'm Rick Blackman, 
And I want you to know that I'm not a figment of John's imagination. John and I talk every morning for a few minutes to pray and give each other the gift of accountability. And I'm very excited to be following in on the series that he's doing on the way. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and a Christian, and I love being able to do this. We've been doing this for a couple of years now, and I hope that we will do it for many more. And so I wanted you to know that any of you that feel unhealthy or neurotic or dysfunctional, you're probably not near as sick as John is. We both hold each other accountable, and I just wanted you to know about that. Thank you. Such a funny guy. Uh, it's not actually a professional diagnosis, so you know, that's just amateur work. Now, why would anybody do this? Why would you go through the, the pain of telling somebody the most embarrassing parts of your life? Paul's writing to Timothy to help hold him accountable to his callings and his commitments, and he puts it like this, train yourself to godliness. For physical training is of some value, but godliness, a great word that's become such a religious cliche, doesn't mean stiffness or, or a forced piety. It means becoming the kind of person that God made me to be, having the kind of joy, love, integrity that characterizes the divine. Godliness has value for all things, holding promise both for the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Train yourself. Now, if you're really serious about physical training, I promise you one thing, you'll get a partner. You'll get a coach. You will crave accountability because of your vision of what physical training can do for you. I always thought it would be fun to be tremendously strong. I never had that kind of body. At our old church, Nancy and I knew a guy named Doug who was in incredible shape. He actually won the Mr. Universe 40 and over contest twice. He had muscles in his hair. He, he looked like he belonged to another species, and he invited me to be his workout partner. Not only was I excited about this, Nancy was excited about this. She said, you got to do this. She said, I would, go you to I would go to watch you and Doug work out. If you couldn't make it, I'd go to just watch Doug work out. <laughs> Doug told me the secret weapon in training is having an accountability partner. They will know you, they will encourage you, they will push you beyond yourself. When you don't feel like doing it, but you know that they're there, you will do that. He said there's a, a saying in training circles, your, best workout se your worst workout session with a partner is better than your best session by yourself. Your worst session with your partner, because they'll push you, they'll challenge you, they'll encourage you, they'll take you going. Your worst one with somebody is better than your best one all by yourself. And with Doug, I lifted, I squatted, I pressed, I curled, I changed my diet, I ingested protein, I went to bed early. You would not believe it to look at me now, but I put on 25 or 30 ounces of solid muscle. Um, <laughs> now, why would somebody do this for a body which is temporary and not for their character which is eternal? Interesting, in our day, we often think of friendships in such superficial ways as having a common interest or people that we work with or or have an affection for somebody. Aristotle in the ancient world said there's three kind of friendships. There's ones that are uh, to your advantage, like networking in business. And, and then there's uh, uh, friendships that are based on common interests, uh, playing together, eating, drinking, something like that. But he said the, the best, the highest form of friendships are marked by what he called training in virtue. When you love somebody so much, that you want goodness to grow in them. And in the New Testament, friendships of accountability, mutual encouragement, confession, admonition, joyful challenge are an indispensable vehicle for what Paul calls training in godliness. And it is quite amazing. I'll just tell you from experience. The more I don't want to talk about something, the stronger my sense of embarrassment or shame and pain about something that makes me not want to tell Rick the stronger the sense of relief and healing and being known and loved I have after I tell them. It's just like, oh, I'm so glad I came into the light. And I'll always, if it's vulnerable, I'll always have that sense of resistance ahead of time and then gratitude afterwards. And it's always that way. We never get past that resistance. 
This is why James says, in a community of mutual accountability where spiritual transformation, discipleship to Jesus is happening, confession is such an important practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We'll talk about confession more next week. It's not my past that makes me sick. It's my secret past. It's not my faults that make me sick. It's my secret faults. It's just true. You are only as sick as your secrets. Secrecy does this. And when you confess, when you step into the light before God, myself, and another person, healing begins amazingly, I had two conversations last week with guys I know. They both live in the Midwest. In both cases, they had been keeping secrets from their spouse. Hadn't had an affair. was a little bit more in the gray zone, but it involved deliberate deception. And they had somebody speaking courageously into their life. And in both cases, they made the courageous decision to come out of deceptions. Really scary. And the freedom that brought to their conscience and the healing that it's bringing to their marriage. It was like a little miracle. And I know, I know, I know some of you who are listening to me, are, your heart's kind of pounding right now because that, am I, do I have the courage to come out of the darkness? It's like your, that's your battle right now. I hope you do. Another observation, accountability works better when I invite it rather than when I endure it. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. In other words, I have a vision of love and good deeds. The person, the, the dad, the husband, the friend, the father, pastor, I want to be. And I know what will derail me, so I'll tell Rick, here's my commitments around finances, around prayer, around truth-telling, around my kids, around my ego, around my time with my wife. And my relationship with Rick the joy, help, and life that relationship brings are so strong at this point that if I violate a commitment I've made, a little voice inside me says, you have to tell Rick that, and it will nag at me till I do. Not because I'm a spiritual and moral giant. If I was a giant, I wouldn't need this, but because the joy and vitality of that relationship have become stronger than the gravitational pull of secrecy and darkness. Accountability is not a magic bullet. doesn't work that way. People in churches sometimes think you can prevent anybody from straying by holding them accountable. Just make them accountable, people will say. If somebody wants to do wrong, they will probably find a way to do wrong. We're pretty good at sneaking around. Self-initiated accountability is the kind that really works rather than enforced. In self-initiated accountability, I have a genuine desire to grow in some area, but I know that because of my weakness or my habits or forgetting, I'm likely to drift. So I ask you as my friend, would you check in with me? Would you give me feedback? Would you be honest? Would you ask me how it's going? And the knowledge that I will talk about this area with you helps give me the strength to do the very thing that God and my best self want me to do. And honestly, it's a little humbling to admit this, sometimes I don't do something wrong only because I know if I do, I'd have to talk to Rick about it and that'd be embarrassing. There have been times when, just to make it stick, I've said to Rick, if I don't keep this commitment, I will pay $1,000 to whatever charity you name, and I have kept those commitments every single time. I am turning my stinginess into a spiritual asset. Uh, at the end of this series, we're going to be doing baptism, and that's a great celebration. It's also an act of corporate accountability. When and some of you are going to do this, and we're going to be so thrilled. A woman or a man stands up in front of the body and says, I'm now declaring my ultimate commitment in front of my ultimate community, the family of God. That leads to the next observation. Accountability takes a lot of courage. A great transforming church community welcomes accountability. A mediocre community avoids it, no matter how great the buildings or the budget might look. Because accountability is scary. And I have known very formidable great leaders where authentic accountability, they just were not willing to enter into. Holding each other accountable takes courage. 
Paul talked about a time when Peter was guilty of legalism, peer pressure, legalism. Look at what he writes. Later, when Peter came to Antioch, I had face-to-face confrontation with him because he was clearly out of line. I spoke up to Peter in front of them all. What right do you have to require non-Jews to conform the Jewish customs just to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem cronies? Do you imagine how much courage that took for Paul? And here's what Peter did not say. Hey, Paul, mind your own business. That's one verse you never see in the Bible. Mind your own business. Because in Jesus' community, everybody's welfare is everybody's business. Now, does that mean, according to the Bible, everybody is supposed to go around telling everybody else where they've gone wrong? No. According to the Bible, that's the pastor's job. It was very interesting. A uh, uh, guy named Patrick Lencioni, he's a consultant, a devote Jesus follower, famously says, there are five dysfunctions in a team. Any community could be a family. A lack of trust, fear of conflict, absence of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and inattention to results. And his organization says the number one problem teams have is avoidance of accountability. And and they have more problem with that than they do all the other four dysfunctions put together. We just we're afraid of this. It takes courage. So I'm asking today, will you have that courage? Last observation. Accountability is not just about avoiding what's bad. It's about pursuing the good. A lot gets written uh, in marketplace circles about leadership in our day. Leaders, uh, workers who take, who are accountable for their work. That is not a new idea. Paul taught followers of Jesus to be accountable to God in their work lives 2,000 years ago. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Another verse you never see in the Bible, that's not my job. Uh, Recently, my mom had to go to the bank to get my brother's name added to an account that was her and my dad's name. And the teller told her that even though my mom was on the account, even though my dad had died and she had my father's death certificate with her at the bank, the teller couldn't do that, that my mom would have to go to the Social Security office and exchange my dead father's Social Security number for a new ID number and come back to the bank. And my mom said, but I called ahead of time. I got an okay. I talked to our lawyer. The bank said, this is all that's needed. And the teller said, I can't do that. It's not my job. You'll have to get out of line and let somebody else come up. And my mom said, I'm not moving. She called her lawyer and put her lawyer on speaker on her cell phone. And her lawyer said, my mom was right. And the teller said, turn that off. You can't have a lawyer on a speakerphone in the bank. I can't do it. It's not my job. And she handed my mom off to somebody else who handed my mom off to somebody else. It took, it's a true story, my 83-year-old mom an hour of not moving to get somebody in the bank to say, it's my job. Now, I won't say the name of the bank, but it wasn't the Bank of Canada or the Bank of Mexico. It was someplace (laughs) in between. Uh, After one of our services, we had one of the vice presidents of that bank come up afterwards, and it's a great bank. I'm sure they do real good work. Uh, uh, Rick and I will talk almost every day about our work. He's a, he's a psychologist. I'm a pastor. Where are you stuck? How's God calling? What wisdom do you need? Where are the opportunities? What are the possibilities today? I promise you, I am a better pastor, more energized than I would otherwise be because I have a friend who helps me to stay accountable to my work to my calling. Every follower of Jesus ought to remember we're accountable for that. Too often we think of accountability just in negative terms. You know, somebody helping you not to gamble or not to drink or overeat or look at that side or whatever. But God's calling on my life is not primarily to avoid doing bad things. God is much more interested in what you're doing than what you're avoiding. One of Jesus' most famous stories is all about this kind of accountability. It says, generous master gives resources, possibility, opportunities to three of his servants. And then, after a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. God is the God of accountability, the God of settled account. It's part of the glory and dignity of being human. One of the great accountability questions will be, what did you do with what you've been given? 
Then the man who gets in trouble in this story didn't do bad things. He just did nothing. He buried his talent. He just refused to live as a steward. He refused to risk. He refused to grow. And he had an excuse. And his excuse was, I knew you were a hard man and I was afraid. So I hid it. We all need accountability because we're all good excuse makers. And because we have such a remarkable life in the kingdom that lies before us. And this is part of how Paul holds young Timothy accountable. He says, Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Apparently, Timothy was tempted to do that. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And you can just imagine young Timothy reading those words. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's who I want to be. Thank you, Paul. It's amazing how many excuses we come up with for why God could not use me. If people in the Bible allowed excuses to keep them from being used by God the way we do, the Bible would never have gotten written. Every character in the Bible had some reason why God could not use them. Timothy was too young. Abraham was too old. Moses was too slow of speech. Aaron was too glib. Elijah was too depressed. Gideon was too scared. Esau was too hairy. Jonah was a runaway. Joseph was a convict. Rahab was a prostitute. Sarah laughed at God. Noah got drunk. Samson had an impulse control disorder. Peter sank. Jacob lied. Thomas doubted. Zacchaeus was greedy, corrupt, and vertically challenged. What's your excuse? What is it? Starting with Jesus and his disciples, relationships of accountability have been part of transforming community ever since. They are in every 12-step group, and they must be in here. Now, we'll talk about them more next week. How do I examine my life? How do I confess to other people? Get on the road to making things right. But I want to give you an assignment this week. Again, this is just the 101 course in the way. So this is a real easy first step. This this week's assignment is not you have to go find somebody and tell them every deep, dark secret in your life. Now, you may already be a considerable way in living in accountability relationships, so you can take whatever the next step is, but this is the first step. Find somebody that you know and trust and tell them about one commitment that you've made, just one. Maybe it's to pray and ask God's will through this series. Maybe it's to read scripture each day through this series. You've got that little calendar, and, and that'll help you do that. Maybe it's a a commitment for an act of generosity to give to God. Maybe it's a commitment to have a, a good attitude at work this week or to volunteer. Maybe it's a big one to get into recovery or to tell the truth that you've been hiding in shame. Or maybe it's just, I'm coming back next week. I want to keep growing. I'm coming back next week. So look for me next week. Call me up if I don't show up. Find one person that you know and trust and tell them, that you're committed to do one next right thing and ask them to check back with you gently in love. And if you begin to do this, if you embrace God's gift of accountable living, you will have greater integrity. You will have more humility, more self-awareness, stronger character, fewer regrets. You will become a better friend, a better worker, a better family member, a better human being. You will live in this life with greater transparency and freedom and have a better shot one day at hearing from God those words, well done, good and faithful servant, because we're all going to be accountable to God in eternity anyway. Let's start now with each other. You all in? Are you all in? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for this remarkable gift of life. And forgive us for the way, God, that we so often settle moment by moment, hour by hour, year by year for lives so far from what you want us. Help this, God, to be a place of enormous grace. Help anybody that's struggling right now because they're feeling... I've blown it, I've messed up, I've failed, I've sunk so deep. God could never use me. God could never redeem me. God, in this moment right now, may your grace and your courage and your healing be very evident to every one of us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thanks so much for tuning in with us today. We hope you feel inspired, maybe even challenged by what you heard in the message today. Maybe figure out how you might want to apply that to your life this week. Please join us again and follow us on social media to find out all the latest happenings here at Menlo Church. We'll see you next time.